Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. Thank you for the opportunity to receive your word. And for me, Lord, thank you for an opportunity to impart your word. Give me the wisdom, the ability, the sensitivity, God, to communicate your word in a way that honors you and builds up the family. Lord, everybody online and everybody here today, encourage us, build us up. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated today. A key scripture for today is John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me, some say in me, you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Sometimes, uh, look at somebody say, I'm a winner. I'm a winner. I, I don't know about you, but I'm a winner. And you may say, Pastor, I don't feel like a winner. Well, by the time this message is over, I think you will. I think you will, because here's what I know about you. You were born to win. You were born, all two of us, right, right? All two of us, you were born to win. You were born to win. And so uh, having said that, I don't always agree with what Jesus writes in the book. Anybody here ever feel like me? Like, so here's what he says. You know, he says, oh, hey, listen, I want you to have peace. But you're going to have tribulation. Well, did anybody ever go, oh, yeah, a trial's coming. I just feel so calm right now. No? Yeah, me neither. And then, he, and then he adds on top of that and goes, oh, by the way, I want you to be cheerful. And I'm thinking, God, what are, you, what are you talking about? How am I supposed to have peace and then be cheerful about trials? Cheerful about trials. And I'm just going to be honest with you. Winners do. Winners do. And you may say, well, Pastor Eli, you called me a winner, but that's not me. I don't get happy when trials come around, and, and I don't have peace in the middle of this struggle. So how could you call me a winner and say that's what winners do, but I don't do that? Anybody as confused as I am about this message right now? Yeah, it, it's challenging when you look at it, but, but let me help you if I can just get a little closer. Earlier in the chapter, in chapter 10, verse 10, the Bible says this. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and life in abundance. So the thief comes to steal. How many of you read your Bible? You're with me today. Come on, we'll try it one more time. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, I, I love that the Bible in John chapter 10 doesn't call him the devil. He doesn't call him Satan. He doesn't call him uh, uh, whatever you would call somebody evil. Right? Here's what they use. Here's the word they use to de describe the enemy in this point. Already, the Bible says he's a thief. A thief. Anybody here a thief? <laughs> Did you see that person go like this? Here, look, look. If you're a thief and you're here, you're a good one. You know why? Because you didn't get caught. How many know a good thief is a thief that doesn't get thought, got caught? If you got caught, you're not a good thief, right? And I think that's important because, because a lot of people don't think about the enemy like a thief. When we think about the devil, here's what we think. We think about uh, something we might have seen uh, on the movie screen from Halloween or Jason 97 or Take Me to Hell or Drag Me to Hell. I don't even know all these movies. Uh, Y'all young people be watching, right? You think of, for, for my generation, it was Freddy Krueger. Y'all remember Freddy Krueger? Yeah, no, okay, you must have been the guy. All right, so what I'm talking about, so we, we have all this imagery of what we think the devil is, so watch this. So we think, I would recognize the devil right now if he came. I'd recognize him. Oh, there he is, right there. Some of you look at your spouse and go, don't, don't do that today. Don't you do that today. <laughs> so, so my point is, my point is, the Bible calls the devil a thief, which means he shows up and you didn't even see it. Which means he comes in you didn't even know he was there. A thief comes in and you don't even know he's been there until the very thing you were needing is gone. It's important that we recognize this point right now because a lot of us are coming to church and don't even realize we've been robbed. 
A lot of you are in a relationship right now and wondering what's going on with this relationship. Why am I feeling this way? Why are these things happening? May I suggest to you, perhaps the thief came in and you didn't even know. Because that's what he does. The thief comes to Now, may I suggest to you this morning that most of the church is only worried about the last two. We're only worried about the enemy comes to kill and destroy. So we say things like when we go through a trial, oh, I made it. I'm still alive. And Satan goes, I didn't come to kill you with that. You're celebrating and you didn't even realize that he won. Because in our mentality, all we're thinking about is survival. Survival. Hey, I made it to church this week. Woo, thank you, Jesus. Wait, 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 wait. Hey, I stayed married. I'm home, right, honey? I'm home, right? Who wants a survivalist marriage? Who wants to live their life with somebody who feels the greatest contribution you have to this marriage is to come home? I don't want you just to come home. I want you to be my husband. I want you to be my wife. I want to live passionate. Am I talking to anybody? Who wants to live life and go, well, I woke up this morning. Here we go. This is another day in the hood. It's another day in the jungle. Who wants to live life that way? And I promise you that there are so many. I want to preach real bad, so let me slow down. There are so many of you today that pull your eyes open in the morning. You just drag them open because you have no purpose in life. You've lost your zeal for life. You lost your passion for life. So everything becomes a drudge. And can I say something to you? Most of you don't even have peace anymore. You have peace anymore. You're like, what happened? You can be in church and missing some of the most vital parts of your life. Because the enemy didn't come to kill you. He first came to steal from you. And people who get stole from and don't recognize it are set up to be people who can be killed and destroyed. Oh, yeah, I'm preaching. How does the enemy steal from us? I want you to stay with me, man. I'll tell you how the enemy steals. First of all, he steals by getting you misdirected misdirection is the focus of the enemy because if he can change your direction you'll miss your destination and void your destiny right if he could just get you so a lot of us come to church with the right intention but we wind up at the wrong destination and so we look at ourselves and we go but i wanted to do right why am i here because somewhere along the line you got misinformation how many of you ever received directions from somebody who don't know how to give directions and you're like waiting in the spot, <laughs> expecting somebody to be there. And you're like, like, oh, no, that's the wrong place. Oh, thanks. Next time I'll ask somebody who. Most people, watch this, please, watch this, please, are shipwrecked because they're getting misinformation. Why would you get counseling for your marriage from somebody who's on their fourth and not working that out right now? Why would you get finance? Uh, am I helping anybody here? Why would you get finance help from a guy who's down at the payday loan every three weeks to get some money? And why would you get church advice from somebody who comes to church once a month when they feel like they want to? Nobody likes this stuff? No? Misdirection is the enemy's plan for your life. And the way he gets you misdirected is by getting you misinformed. Some say misinformed. He wants to misinform you because if he misinforms you, then he can misdirect you and cause you to miss what's important to you. Like, can I address my text now? Is that all right? Jesus says, be of good cheer when you receive tribulation. Have you ever met anybody that gave you that advice? Here's what I find. Most people give you, most people give you their sorrow advice. Most people give you their troubled advice. And so what happens, if you'll just bear with me for a minute, is we start living our life according to other people's experiences. You, you follow what I'm saying? So people start saying to you, hey, man, listen, no, you, you can't survive that. You can't go through that. You can't deal with that. You should just quit. You should just give up. That's too hard. Stop going. It doesn't take all of that. Wait, wait, wait. Where are you getting that information from? Because watch what Jesus says. Jesus said, in this life, you should have 
tribulation, so be of. Shut the front door. You mean because this person is sad, I don't have to be sad? Because this person gives up doesn't mean I have to give up? Can I say something to you? I don't care how many books you read on philosophy. I don't care how much books you read on, on, on the, the study of the human mind or human emotions. None of those authors was your author. None of those creators was our creator. And when the creator of the universe speaks to you about your abilities, you shouldn't second guess him. And if he says to you, you could be in the middle of a trial and have a smile on your face, then my friend, you ought to believe what God says about you. Come on, you believe everybody. We believe everybody, but we don't believe what God says about you. And we got to start believing because the enemy is stealing our ability to do what God wants us to do. Look at somebody say, he's a thief. He's a thief. Pastor Eli, you can't possibly expect me to be a good cheer. Well, let me tell you why the church struggles to be happy in trials. And when I tell you the church, I'm not excluding myself from this conversation. I'm preaching to the preacher today. So can I say amen to myself? Amen. Amen. Okay, you still with me? Most of us want Jesus to extract us from trial. And sometimes he does. Do you remember when the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt? And God comes to deliver them? He says this to them. Grab a lamb. Sacrifice the lamb. Take the blood. Put it over the doorpost. Right? Right? And when the death angel comes, he will, I know somebody reads their Bible in this place, come on. When the death angel comes, he will, how many of you got passed over some stuff you deserved? Come on, how many know some of the people in the room was as guilty as some of those people outside the room? Thank you for the one hand in the room here today. Come on, some of us, if we'll be honest today, the Lord should have The Lord should have, it should have been you over there in the orange jumpsuit. It should have been you in that trial. It should have been you in that struggle. But the Lord, aren't you glad that God passes us over even though we don't deserve to be passed over and he passed us over? The problem with the church is that we always want to be passed over. Hey, Jesus, you passed over that time. Can you pass over this one? You hook the brother up over there. Can you hook the sister up over here? And the truth is, it's not always about being passed over. Sometimes it's about passing through. Passing like what? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Some trials we don't get to go over. Some trials we get to go through. Why would God say, be of good cheer when you're going through the trial? Who does that? Well, I got to be honest with you, a story that comes to mind is the three Hebrew boys who got thrown into a fiery furnace. And the Bible says it wasn't just hot, it was seven times hotter than what it originally was. And this time when the Hebrew boys went into a fire, there was an observation made by the king who threw them in the fire. He said, hey, didn't we tie those guys up before we threw them in? And he said, yeah, we did. Why are they walking around in the fire? See, if you and I could learn to keep the right attitude and we keep cheer in our life in the middle of the trial, what if God wanted to show up in the middle of your fire and begin to loosen the things that bound you up? Come on, stay with me for just a minute. Maybe this trial is nothing more than to burn off the stuff the world's been trying to put on you. The stigmas, the thing they've called you since you were five years old, ten years old. You're always going to be this. You're always going to be that. It's in those moments when you're in the fiery furnace and the devil is trying to turn it up to burn you up. If you can keep cheer, the things that came to burn you will only burn what bound you. And the king goes, those jokers are walking around loose. What keeps other people bound, God will send to loose you. Are you tracking with me? Listen to this. 
And then, Anna, he says this. How many jokers did we put in there? He said, we put three. He's like, why do I see four? And why is that fourth one shining brighter than the fire? Don't ask God to take you out of the trial because if God didn't take you out of the trial, it's because he wants to meet you in the trial. I know you're trying to run out, but God says, no, baby, I want to show up in the middle of your trial because I want all of your accusers and everybody who made fun of you and everybody who talked about you. I want to show them that I've been with you the whole time and that I never left you or forsook you. In the fire. Look at your neighbor and say, don't run. Don't run. Don't run. You get anything out of this yet? I'm trying to get through my introduction. Can I say this to you? Are you ready? You ready? For some people, your stagnation is not a result of your actions, but a result of your attitude. I'll try that one more time. For some of us, our stagnation or the lack of moving forward is not a result of your actions. It's a result of your attitude. Makes sense? Sometimes you got to go through with a smile on your face. You ever been through a rough situation with a complainer? Jesus. Give them trying to raise these two puppies. And sometimes, Chris, they don't shut up. I love my puppies. I'm trying to be patient with them. I really like them a lot. They're really cool. But there are times I had to look at that dog the other day. I just looked at it and I said, will you just shut up? Some of you, it's not that you're not coming to church. It's that you're coming to church with the wrong attitude. Some of you, it's not that you're coming home to your marriage. You're coming home, but you come home with the wrong attitude. I'm going to make him this food here. He better like it. She better be happy I'm coming home. Who wants to be with your ugly attitude? <laughs> My parents better be happy I come home. You better be happy they let you back in. <laughs> the attitude you got. My boss better be happy I showed up to work. What, you don't want a paycheck? What kind of attitude is that? Oftentimes, like, I don't know why my life isn't moving forward. It's not your actions. Sometimes you're doing all the right things, but nobody wants to be with negative Nancy. I don't know if nobody wants to hear this. Uh, I know. You just think everything should be peaches and roses and everybody should just love you. Pastor, I'm just like Jesus. I'm like, how's that? Jesus is a lamb and I'm a lamb. Well, can I say something to you? You're only half right. Because if you read the book of Gen- Revelation, you'll see that in the beginning of Revelation, Jesus comes in like a lamb. But if you read the end of Revelation... He leaves like a lion. (gasps) Eli, what are you saying? I'm saying some people don't get it. Like some people only want to be the lamb, and it's good to be the lamb. I'm just going to be quiet. Just going to go. But Jesus wasn't only a lamb. He was a lamb and a lion. And and I'm going to say something to you. I've been waiting all morning to get to this point right here. That some of you started off as a lion And now you're just a lamb. How did you go from being so passionate for God, so passionate for life? Now you wake up every morning and you just hope just to make it through the day. What happened? How did we get there? Can I suggest something to you? Maybe the thief came in and stole the lion that was in your life. So now he has you content with you come to church, but you only got half of what God wanted you to have because you got the lion, the lamb, but you don't have the lion. Are you tracking with me? And I want today, with all my heart, I want with all my heart today for you to understand that I came this morning to help you resurrect your lion. Pastor, you're like, what are you talking about? Jesus was a lamb while they were pulling his beard. Jesus was a lamb while they were spitting in his face. 
Jesus was a lamb while they tore his back with 39 stripes. And he was a lamb when they laid him on that cross and put nails in his hands. He was a lamb. He didn't raise his voice. He didn't utter a word. He didn't complain one time. When they put him in the grave, they buried a lamb. But here's what they didn't realize. That after three days of marinating that lamb, what came out of that tomb was not a lamb. What came out of that tomb was a lion. It was a lion who resurrected that day. And I came to tell you, it's time for you to stop being just a lamb and let the lion resurrect inside of you. All those people who've been making fun of you, all those people who've been making sure you couldn't move forward, all those people who've been planning your demise and planning your stagnancy, and for every time the thief came into your life to steal your joy and rob your progress, what he didn't realize was he was messing with a lion, and he's about to recognize this morning that that dormant lion is about to live again in this house, about to come alive in this house. You're a lion. You're a winner. You're a warrior. I don't feel like a warrior. I didn't ask what you felt like. I didn't ask what you've learned through your crisis and through your tribulation. I'm telling you by design that when God formed you in your mother's womb, he made half of you a lamb for the first season of your life, but then he made you a conqueror, an overcomer, one who takes property, one who takes ground, one who advances. You are. You're a lion. I don't act like a lion. I know. I don't feel like a lion. I get it. We don't feel like a lion because if I may suggest to you, the enemy stole our lion. I, I, some of you may think, Eli, you know, you're preaching at me today. You're, you're just talking about me. Well, if the shoe fits, my friend, number one. Don't get mad at the preacher, right? Number two, you just don't know what you're talking about. Because I'm not preaching at anybody. Gip, there was a day where I was bolder than what I was today. There was a day when I was more courageous about, there were days I would walk this city and walk at that sun dome and think, when God, are we going to possess this sun dome for a Sunday morning service every Sunday, 52 weeks out of a year? And now I found myself because of things that happened around me, because of trials I went through. I didn't even pray prayers like that anymore. I don't dream dreams like that anymore. I found myself going backwards and being discouraged. And what I didn't realize, Frank, is somewhere along the way, I allowed mess to come in and steal the lion that God made me. And so I realized that there are three things that the enemy uses, three things that he uses to take our lion from us. And I want to share those three with you. Anybody want to learn those real quick? If I'm yelling too much, write me a letter. I think Pastor Lee might read it. I just feel a little passionate today about the lion that you are and that the enemy has been stealing from us. Is that all right? Here are three things. Can I say them to you? A storm, a thorn, or a cross. A storm, a thorn, or a cross. You may say, Pastor Eli, what the world is a storm, a thorn, and a cross? Those are the three things in the New Testament that the Bible categorizes every trial under. Every struggle, every trial you go under is going to be either a storm, it's going to be a thorn, or it's going to be a cross. Does that make sense? So somewhere you went through a storm, somewhere you have a thorn, and some of us have got a cross, and it's those moments the enemy comes to try to steal what God gave you. You track it with me? So let me, if I can, just walk through them really quickly. Somebody say a storm. A storm is a temporary season of inconvenience that the enemy wants to use to get you to act impulsively. It's a season, a temporary season of inconvenience that the enemy wants to use to get us to act impulsively. Somebody say storm. In Matthew chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, excuse me, um, 
Jesus invites the disciples to get into the boat and cross to the other side. Who invited them? Where did Jesus invite them to? He said, get in the boat and let's go to the other side. This is the only time I can tell you that Jesus reminds me of my son Zion. If you ever travel with Zion, Phil, you already know. If you, already, if you ever travel with Zion, Zion got one mission when he gets into a car. <laughs> he is out. First thing Jesus did when he got in this boat. He's like, y'all, y'all got where we're going, right? You know how to get there, right? Leave a brother alone. Jesus is out. He's asleep. And the Bible says that while Jesus was sleeping... A storm came. A storm came. I want you to hear this. The disciples started saying things in the storm while Jesus was in the boat. They're saying, like, this storm's too big. They're saying things like, we're going to die. And can I say something to you? Your reaction to the storm is more detrimental to your health than the storm itself. Oh, you better hear me. How could you do anything but win if you're in a storm and Jesus is in the boat? There's nothing but win, but what you and I have a tendency to when we lose our lion is lambs get afraid. They get fearful when they hear thunder. Lambs get afraid when they feel the rain. Lambs get afraid when they're out of control. And Peter's like, Peter's like I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to die. We're going to die. Be careful what you say in your storm. Be careful what you look to in your storm. He felt helpless because he had no way out of the storm. And then watch his interpretation. He said, Jesus, how could you sleep while we're going through this? The disciples interpreted Jesus' inactivity as though he didn't care about them. How could, if you really cared, how could you let this happen? If I was really important to you, Jesus, why would you let this happen to me? I wonder, have you ever been in a storm and asked Jesus, how could you? Because after all, after all, Drew, we only got in the boat because you asked us to. You, you asked me to get in this boat and then you're going to lead me into a storm? How many of you could help Jesus out? I could help Jesus out in a moment like that. I'm like, Jesus, I know 10 people right now who could really use this storm. I'll give you, awful quiet, right? I'll give you an address. I know where they're at right now. They didn't even get in the boat, Jesus. I got in the boat with you, and you're going to send me to the storm. You must not care about me. Can I say something to you? There is no way that you and I should let the storms of life Keep us in the bracket of a lamb. Jesus got up. The Bible said he stood at the edge of the boat and he began to roar. The, stun- the thunder and the lightning and the storms have to recognize the roar of the, of the lion. And so I want to say to you, don't you let the storms steal your roar. Don't you let the storm. Jesus is in your boat. He hasn't gone anywhere. Jesus is in your world. He hasn't gone anywhere. Stand on the edge of your storm and roar. Don't let the thunder steal who you are. Don't let it make you act impulsively. Someone say impulsively. We gotta hurry up. Number two, the thorn, the thorn, the thorn. Paul says in Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter twelve, he says that the Lord sent, or that there was a messenger from Satan who came to buffet him. Someone say buffet him. And, and that Jesus, he asked Jesus three times to take it from him. And God said, no, I'm not going to take it from him. And, and can I just give that to you in an Eli form? Can I give it to you what I see? I don't like this picture. This is one of those moments I'm saying, like, God, I don't understand why you do this stuff. Because uh, you ever just look at God and go, like, I don't like that. No, I'm the only one, okay? The rest of you are heathens, all right? And it's all. So, 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 so Paul is like Jesus. By the way, this word buffet means to be persistent. Persistent and agitating. It's not hurting him. It's just bugging the life out of him. You ever have a cousin like that? 
of sibling. Don't you look at your spouse. Don't you do it right out of here. You have somebody that just agitates you and they don't stop. It won't quit. And Paul's like, Jesus, would you please take this from me before I choke him out? I'm going to Tyson Fury, this joker right here. Right? It's this constant bullying, this constant pressure. And God, God stood back. He stood back and he goes, wait, 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 wait. You want me to take this out of your life? Why? Because it, it's painful. But I've never seen you pray so much. But it, but it just agitates me. I've never seen the anointing so real in you. She says, I'm suffering. I've never seen you so successful. Oftentimes, we look at the little it's agitating nuances that bother us, but we fail to see that here he was with a thorn in his flesh and wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Here he was with thorns in the flesh, getting revelation from the Almighty. Here he was with a thorn on the flesh, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and turning the world on its ear. Lions don't stop with thorns reward in the middle of the thorn bush. I know I'm feeling more excited about this message than you are. I know the lions roar. And you ever, look at Teresa and I, we're two different people, man. My wife, I promise you, she's one of those jokes, jokers you saw on TV that could walk on coals. I can't walk on carpet that's jacked up. That's how some of y'all look when trial comes. Can't go through a little trial. Can't go through a little headache. Can't step on anything. You are a lion. Stop letting the thorn set you in a place that God didn't design for you. Remember I told you that misdirection comes from misinformation? Sometimes misinformation comes from good people. Somebody say good people. Sometimes misinformation comes from good people. Let me tell you what I mean. We serve a perfect God, and we live in imperfect worlds. And so because we live in an imperfect world, we are imperfect people. How many of you mean good? How many of you have ever done something bad while you meant to do good? How many of you ain't going to raise your hands and admit nothing today? Come on. Most of us today will have the courage to go, I didn't mean to say that. I didn't mean to do that. And what happens is if you're not giving that person grace, that person's decisions affect you. So I hate to say this, but allow me to say it, please. Most people mess up because they listen to old Christians who couldn't withstand their storms and thorns. Come on, listen to me. Oh, Christians who lost their roar want you to remain roarless. Oh, Christians who couldn't get past their pain want you to remain in yours. They don't even know it because they've been, their, their lion got stolen. Remember, the, devil, the devil's he deceives. He's a thief. They don't even realize. They're not doing it because they're bad people. They just didn't realize that they lost their roar. And now they don't, they don't realize that what they're doing is they're affecting your roar. That's why I'm here to tell you today, don't you take any advice from somebody who hasn't survived the storm. Don't take any advice from somebody who don't have scratches from their thorn in their life and can still roar. Find you somebody who's been through a storm and still roars. Find you somebody who's got thorns and still roars. Make sense? Even church people mean good. Do some jacked up stuff. Okay, last one. Got to be careful with the storms. Got to be careful with the thorns. Got to be careful with the cross. So I'm going to say the cross. <laughs> cross, it's the inconvenience you choose because you value your calling more than your comfort. What is a cross? A cross is what you pick to do for Jesus or what Jesus asked you to do that you willingly did because you realized that your calling was more important than your comfort. 
Anybody do that here? You have to raise your hand. Anybody start a ministry? Start a life group? Anybody take on a cause? Anybody start something for God? And then, stay with me, please. Then the cross got too heavy. Just got too heavy. And, and I want you to be careful with that because when we get in crisis, oftentimes we say things like I was talking about a minute ago that we don't intend to say. Remember Job's wife? Job's wife looked at him and said, Job, just curse God and die. Spouse of the year. When your wife looks at you and goes, hey, just die. Remind me to buy you an extra diamond when we come to our anniversary. It's easy to sit here and criticize Job's wife. But you and I weren't the ones watching him deteriorate on her watch. You weren't the ones cleaning those wounds and saw the pain that wouldn't relent. You weren't the one dealing with the loss of not only his children, but she birthed those children. It's easy to sit here and criticize what people say in moments of hardship. So I'm not here to criticize what somebody may have said, but I am here to tell you that don't let what people say in pain change what God called you from the womb. From the womb, you've been called to be a lion. From the womb, you've been called to be a world changer. From the womb, you've been called to change this world. Don't let somebody else's pain. Job looked at his wife and goes, I get it, baby. I understand your struggle. But right now, don't say anything more. I don't need that in my life right now. I need the voice of a lion. I need somebody. And in case you might be wondering, Pastor Eli, you know, what if it's just too heavy? Can I say something to you? You're not the only one who got burdened by the weight of the cross. You're not the only one who buckles under the weight of ministry, the weight of sacrifice. You're not the only single mom who's had to carry all by herself. You're not the only father who's had to do this all by himself. And yes, sometimes your knees are going to buckle. Yes, sometimes you're going to fall and what you were trying to sustain is going to hurt. But can I say something to you? Jesus, the very Lamb of God, was carrying his cross down to the Via Dolorosa. And the weight became so great. The Bible says he fell. That's what I love about this story. You don't abandon the cross when you fall. You get around people who are cross carriers. You're in the right place. If you feel like the cross has been too heavy and you're collapsed, you're in the right place. If you feel like you've been carrying this so long and you don't know what's going to happen, you're in the right place because we're not going to watch you fall. We're not going to watch you on the ground. We're going to come alongside you just like Simon did. And we're going to get underneath that cross with you. And we're going to carry it with you because we're not going to leave you alone. We're lions and we roar. Don't fight alone. Don't fight alone. Get your roar back. You remember what it was like? You remember when you stood in front of the trial, how strong you felt? Remember when you came out of your connection with God and it felt like you could conquer the world? And now you live and you come to church and you hope to just survive. But I'm asking you a question today. What happened to your lion? Where's your lion at? Did you let him steal it? Did he come in when you weren't watching in the storm? Did he come in in the middle of the thorn when somebody was saying something negative to you? Did he come in then? Did he come in when you were carrying your cross and, and you had a moment and it got too difficult and you gave up? Is that when he came in? I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to blame you. I'm not here to shame you. 
I came this morning with a simple assignment. There is a lion that is dormant inside of you. And I pray by the Spirit of God that you feel that lion resurrecting just like Jesus did on the third day out of that grave. This morning is going to be the beginning of the resurrection of the lion inside of you. You're going to conquer. You're going to take ground. You're going to write that book. You're going to start that business. You're going to launch that career. You're going to make that marriage. You're going to make that family. You're going to roar. Roar. Pastor Eli, it's hard. Roar anyways. Pastor Eli, I'm alone. Roar anyways. Pastor Eli, the fire is hot. Just wait a minute. The lion is going to come to line up with your lion, and together you're going to roar like you've never roared. My God, is anybody hearing what I'm saying today? Your quiet days are over. Your weak days are over. You may have come like a lamb today, but you, my friend, are leaving like a lion. You're leaving like a lion. You're leaving like a lion. I hope to God that you hear by the Spirit what I'm calling you up out of today. You were born to be a lion born to be a lion born to be a lion wake up in the morning to see what's next to conquer open your eyes in the morning with passion and zeal not that life isn't hard you're just harder Ah, two of you got that not that life isn't difficult but you eat difficult for breakfast It's, it's what I do I kill giants that makes sense. Not everybody likes lions. I'm going to end, really. 30 more minutes. I'm going to be ending. Everybody likes. You know, Saul loved David when David was playing the harp and helping him calm down from his evil spirits. He loved him. He loved him. But the minute David recognized that he was a lion and he stood face to face with Goliath and he killed Goliath, all of a sudden Saul wasn't too happy anymore. All of a sudden, Saul started getting nervous and agitated. Let them get agitated. Let them get nervous. Let all those people who made fun of you, all those people who tolerated you, all those people who patted you on the back like you were nothing, like somehow you were doing, they were doing you a favor. Listen, let them all do what they want to do. The day you will rise as the lion that you are, some of those people are going to phase out of your life, and God's going to set you in a whole new arena. Man, he's, I feel the lion inside of you waking up again. I feel it in here. I feel some of you being stirred by the Holy Spirit right now. I feel some of you starting to believe again. I see tears of refreshing and tears of restoration coming down. I see the wind of the Holy Spirit blowing over your life again. I see it. I see it. So if you're ready to be a lion, would you do me a favor? Stand to your feet and give God the biggest praise you got. Just give him the biggest praise you got. Come on.